ladies and gentlemen, good evening and um, welcome to everyone and all of you here and on YouTube. Tonight, Norma, an opera that everyone knows, but we don't seem to be able to see it so often. In its early history, um, 1831, La Scala, but just around the corner at uh, the Haymarket, 1833, Drury Lane, 1837, Covent Garden, 1841. So they had it <laughs> at the beginning of its performance life much more often than we're, uh, we're having it here. Um, this, is, this production is um, 30 years after the last time it was performed on this stage. So um, it tells you a lot about the piece, actually, because it, does, it is, has something special about it, something that naturally inevitably recalls names like Callas, Sutherland, Caballé, the great tenors, Vickers, Del Monaco, Corelli. Um, but uh, I think we've got the right cast uh, this time. <laughs> and um, finally, it's an opera I've been waiting to do for so long, I can't tell you. It's, it's, it's almost been painful because I, I love this opera so much. It's a combination of vehemence, um, pathos, lyricism, and just, well, it's, it's no accident that it's at the peak of the bel canto. It just has big bones. It's a big story, big emotions. And with, for all the beauty that's in it, it's heartbreaking and strong and dramatic. Um, I really, really uh, am proud uh, to be conducting this new production uh, in this house. But if you can't make it uh, into the house, we're actually going to be performing this opera for our cinema audience worldwide. So, 26th of September, live in cinemas around the world. Go to roh.org.uk slash cinema to find your closest screening. And send me some thoughts on Twitter. Now, I have no idea how to use this Twitter <laughs> stuff, but I I there are others of you out there who do, so um, please, go ahead and tweet. Uh, <laughs> um, what are you seeing tonight? Well, we have an action-packed evening for you, hopefully bringing illumination, information to you about this wonderful piece. I'll be joined by uh, Joseph Kalea, singing the role of Polione, um, the director Alex Ole, and his associate director Valentina Carrasco from uh, La Fura del Spaus, who are here for the second time in a very short space of time here at the garden, and I'm very happy about that. And yours truly will be introducing to you the music. Um, it's the first time I conduct Bellini at Covent Garden, but um, it's an Italian opera. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but first, I'm very, very happy to present to you Professor Margaret Reynolds from Queen Mary University of London, who sets up the history for us and tells us who is or who was this lady Norma? Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you, Tony. It is a fantastic opera. I've been having the most wonderful time thinking about this. There's a rather lovely moment in the 2009 film called The Young Victoria. I don't know how many of you might have seen this where Albert, at the instigation of the King of, king of the Belgians, King Leopold I of Belgium, is being primed to woo the princess. So he has his tutor quiz Albert about Victoria's interests. They do books and they do entertainment and then they get to music. What's her favourite opera? 
Albert hesitates. Norma, he says. Wrong, says the tutor. I puritani. <laughs> well, a bit later on in the film, we get to see how things are going because Victoria tells Albert that she's changed her mind and Norma is her favourite opera after all. Now, Julian Fellows, who wrote the script for this film, has clearly done his work here. In the 1830s, Victoria saw Norma, many of these London performances that Tony has talked about, saw Norma performed several times. And she made at least four drawings of scenes from the opera. And it seems to me not at all surprising that this young princess would be interested in this particular work. Norma is one of several significant operas in the early 19th century that are kind of queen operas, where strong women try to negotiate a path between duty and desire. Norma is not, of course, actually a queen. But she is the charismatic leader of her people, a visionary and a politician, and all of these roles she has to perform. In the earliest productions, Norma is also portrayed with the attributes of a queen, the sacred wreath on her head, the sickle in her hand like a scepter. So, the plot. Norma is the high priestess of a druid cult in first century Gaul. Her country has for some time been occupied by Rome under the leadership of the proconsul Polione. While the Gauls all hate Polione and would like to rebel, Norma urges peace. This is where Casta Diva comes in. But unknown to all the Gauls, Polione and Norma have been secretly married for many years and they have two children that Norma keeps hidden. Now, Polione has fallen in love with Adalgisa, another younger priestess. When he's recalled to Rome, Polione persuades Adalgisa to go with him. But first of all, Adalgisa decides to confess to her guilty love to Norma, the high priestess, forgives her. But then she is horrified to discover that Adalgisa's lover is none other than Polione. Norma contemplates killing her children to save them from slavery in Rome. But Adalgisa is angered by Polione's deception and takes Norma's case. She sets off for the Roman camp in an attempt to plead Norma's cause. Oroveso, Norma's father, and the other Gallic warriors are desperate to rise up against the Romans. When Polione refuses to listen to Adalgisa, Norma strikes the sacred gong, announces that they will go to war, and says that she has a sacrificial victim in mind, one who has betrayed her country, her people, and her vows. It is Norma herself. She asks Oroveso to take care of her children and goes to the funeral pyre. His love, reawakened by her sublime sacrifice, uh, Polione goes to the pyre with her and joins her in death. The first performance as, of Norma, as Tony has said, was in Milan in December 1831. Bellini's librettist was Felici Romani. And what that summary does not tell you is how very tightly the words and the fabulous music, which you'll be hearing later on today, um, go together. But there are other reasons why this opera has stayed in the repertoire and not all of them are entirely obvious to us now in the 21st century. Firstly, there is that question of the strong and powerful woman. In the late 18th, early 19th century, many women were claiming new rights to education, employment, property, the franchise, and especially to do with rights within marriage. So Norma was intriguing to audiences then, including the Queen herself, as she still is today for the same reason, though in a different context. The 1830s Norma has to reconcile her claims to power with the contradictions of her feelings and her private life, and that was not so easy in the 19th century. In fact, of course, it's not very easy today either. Um, I'm reminded of poor Theresa May on the steps of Downing Street and of press photographers booing her for refusing to kiss her husband in public. Well, she was right, of course. But back to Norma. I think it's telling that the two people, apart from Polione, of course, who know Norma's secret are both women, Clotilda and eventually Adalgisa. The drive for female solidarity was a very 19th century topic, and Act One ends with a big duet for Norma and Adalgisa, very like the male friendship duets that appear later in later operas, especially Verdi. 
Intriguingly, one of Victoria's drawings portrayed this very scene between Norma and Adelgisa. But even this old idea of a romantic female friendship can also be modernised. And there have been productions where it is Adelgisa who pushes Pollione aside and goes to the pyre with Norma at the end. <laughs> Another one of Victoria's drawings shows Norma with a knife in her hand, creeping up on her two little children who are sitting in a very undruid-like armchair. Now, it's true that Romani had based the story of Bellini's opera on a play by Alexandre Sumet that had been staged in Paris, and it was called Norma or the Infanticide. But Romani had his own take on the, on the story. Bellini's Norma does not actually do the deed, but there were many operas at this time produced in London which did base themselves on the story of Medea, and she does do it. Medea does kill her own children. And why were such stories of mothers killing children relevant to the early to the mid-19th mid century? Because they tapped into the current debates about divorce law reform. Divorce was effectively impossible in Britain until the late 1850s, and then still difficult for women. And in particular, it spoke to the contemporary agitation over the laws regarding the custody of children. Fathers had absolute rights over children in the 19th century, and children became pawns in many bitter marital struggles. Well, that one hasn't gone away either. One notorious case where exactly this happened was that of Rosina bulwer lytton wife of the well-known novelist. She was denied access to her very young children after she separated from her husband. The campaigning around this issue was to lead to the Custody of Infants Act of 1839, which gave some restricted rights to mothers, and to the various Matrimonial Causes Act from 1857 on, which legislated for divorce. Romani himself had, much earlier, written the libretto for Simon Mayer's opera, Medea in Corinto. And Judea Pastor, who created the role of Norma, had sung Mayer's Medea in London. Women who thought about killing their children to exact revenge on a husband who has abandoned them had a special meaning for audiences in the 19th century. But Norma contemplates it for another reason. And that brings me on to my next point. Norma is worried that her children will be enslaved by Rome. Remember that this is an occupied country, that the Gauls are a subject people. This, too, was a key issue in the 19th century. The Greek Wars of Independence had only just finished in 1832. Belgium had, was declared independent from Dutch rule in 1830. It, for men, much of the century, many Italian states were occupied by Austria, leading to the revolutions of the 1840s. Resentment against an invading nation was a common theme in art at this time, and Norma is part of that as was the actual question of slavery itself. The 1830s saw many slave rebellions in the southern plantations of America, and there was a great deal of agitating around the abolitionist cause. Of course, England herself was not entirely blameless in the question of colonialism, and the problem was compounded by the growth of empire across the 19th century. But in contemporary 19th century British productions of Norma, the sympathy seems to lie with the suffering of the Gauls as a subject race, and with the promotion of their religious values insofar as they are associated with nature, the oak, the mistletoe, the moon. The tension between the monumental power of Rome as against the elemental character of the Gauls is particularly clear in early set designs, where the elaborate structures of the Romans from 1831 compare with the more natural outdoor settings for the Gauls, including uh, a nicely unruined Stonehenge. Actually, having said that, this question of cultural difference and conflict is one very key to the 19th century norma. The fact is that it is always relevant. And here, I was thinking, uh, as I was thinking about norma this week, I kept returning to the story of the very up-to-the-moment question of the burkini and the legislation of some French authorities that bans them on the beaches. It makes me think of Pollione. In the libretto, here he is unequivocally scornful of the Druid religion. And yet, he has already got one priestess to break the vows of her rule. 
and unveil herself before him. And now he wants to do it all over again. One dominant culture forces itself on another. But to go back to the beginning, Norma is really about Norma. Do you notice how many times her name is said in the libretto? How many times the name is said Norma over and over again? And one other thing occurs to me. The Casta Diva aria in Act One is rightly incredibly famous. But that distinctive arpeggio accompaniment appears two more times. The second time is in Old Remembranza from Act One, Scene Two, when Norma listens to Adol Jesus' confession but thinks about her own love from long ago. And the third is in the last act with In Mia Man Alfin's Toussaint, At Last You're in My Hands, where Norma bargains with Polioni. The point is that in each of these three scenes, Norma is performing. She is performing priestess, mentor, leader, and it's that public role that is there in the melody. But in the kind of sighing accompaniment, Bellini shows us her vulnerability and her pain. When they were working on the opera, Bellini wrote to Pasta that he and Romani were creating an all-inclusive character for her. Every emotion is in there. That's what he did then, and that's what we still love about her now. Thank you. Thank you to Margaret Reynolds. That's um, terrific information. I'm sorry I couldn't see the pictures behind me. Uh, um, I'm delighted to introduce now Joseph Calea, who is going to be performing uh, our Polione in this new production. Joseph. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. So this is a, a debut for you. Um, you take on a new role, um, especially a role that has been associated with um, several uh, famous singers. I mentioned before John Vickers, uh, Del Monaco, Corelli, uh, these people. Um, Luciano even recorded it, of course, Placido, all these names. Um, what's, what's the attraction? Well, after that opening, I was going to leave the um, room, but they stopped me at the door. <laughs> <laughs> no, the attraction for me is um, twofold. I think that the beginning of the opera, uh, my um, recitativo, flowed by the aria, and then the cabaletta, is very challenging music because it combines um, meltic, melting lyricism with then an almost spintoish cabaletta. After Spinto that. Um, is a word that's a very interesting word because it describes a type of voice usually associated with um, a tenor, but not only. That the word spinto means pushed slightly, but it means a voice tending towards the dramatic. Exactly. And and I wanted to, of course, add this beautiful opera to my repertoire. But there's another interesting fact is that the 1951 or 52 production with Maria Callas as Norma and Joan Sutherland as uh, Clotilde, Clotilde. Um, the Flavio, which is this, uh, the secondary uh, role, uh, tenor role in the opera, was sung by my teacher. So that's a quiet Paul Asha. He was the Flavio here in that production here in Covent Garden. And um, th there's a story, of course, that Joan Sutherland used to make holes in the Tapestry. Back then, back then, the scenes were made of tapestry, so you could literally poke a hole through them. And the story about Joan Sutherland uh, um, making a hole to watch Maria Callas has been indeed confirmed by my teacher. So it is actually. <laughs> so it is. It is. So it is really true. It's a, f a fantastic role, and um, I'm here sort of representing as well the rest of my cast: um, Sonia Yoncheva and um, Sonia Ganassi. We have two Sonias in this cast, and it's been a pleasure so far. The, um, the world that we're in, in the, the bel canto uh, world, it's not um, usually uh, a repertoire that, is, um, that you sing all the time. You've, your voice has grown considerably over the last few years. 
And so, but uh, would you agree that this part can use, albeit it isn't a bel canto part, but it could, it, it, it needs this kind of full voice to stand up to such an important role as Norma. Would you agree with that? I mean, absolutely, which I think uh, that's why in the past, especially, the role of Polione was cast with um, Lirico Spinto, again, what he explained before, and full dramatic tenors, tenors like Del Monaco, like Corelli, like Giacomini, etc. Because, you know, to stand to a soprano, to a power horse like Maria Callas, of course, Polione couldn't be um, you know, a wimpy sounding tenor, they needed a full, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they needed a full, a full, a full voice. And I think that um, my vocal evolution, uh, now is the right time to, to face such a role. Well, that's nice to hear from a yeah. singer that there, there is, um, one has to wait sometimes <laughs> to, before taking on certain roles. And that's, 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 that's really good to hear. Um, I think the, um, the meat of the matter in this opera is, are the duets. Mm. And you have um, a couple of stunning duets, one with Adalgisa, uh, one with Norma at the end, and the three of you get together for this magnificent trio. Yeah. Um, this, um, would you say that as an actor, you are more challenged in an opera like this than perhaps in other bel canto operas? Especially nowadays, because nowadays the people is not enough to give them mellifluous, um, beautiful singing. Of but course. you will give us that. Yes, of yeah, course. Okay, you yeah. <laughs> Thank I you. Said, <laughs> I said I hope so. But I, I think that um, uh, Polione, I, I think that the Libertist, um, apart from the story of Norma, of course, that we had um, the brilliant synopsis of it um, from the speaker before me. Um, but um, I think that uh, Polione was not... Uh, first and foremost, a uh, general proconsul, but he was a tenor. Um, why? Because, of course, it's about him. Um, when he first, um, you know, he ruins the life of five, five people, at least, you know, Oroveso, Dalgiza, the kids, and, of course, Norma, and himself, so it's six. But he, <laughs> but he actually, um, when, he, when his love dies out for Norma, and there are reasons um, f f for that, but you know, he says that it was you know an, a sort of an, an, an evil god that um, forced him to to fall in love with yet another priestess from from the same, you know, from the druids. So it's um, and and this is perfectly explained and perfectly demonstrated in the duos and in the um, trios afterwards. And he's he's also um, very charismatic. Well, he has to be for Norma to be interested in him in the first place. Yeah, there's a, there's a tremendous um, feeling of oppression. You know, these, these uh, pieces, um, you have a whole chorus that really hates your guts, you know, and, and, uh, um, and, and hates everything that Rome uh, represents. Um, is that, uh, I mean, usually tenors love to be loved, don't they? I mean, you know, yeah. but I, I think there is a, a certain weight on your shoulders when you come out. I mean, there are examples of that nowadays. Look at Iraq, look at um, Syria. There's, it is so um, relevant. The wonderful team, you know, Alex and Valentina, um, in, the, in the rehearsal process, um, we discussed this so much, how relevant it is um, to this day and, and, and age. And um, yes, I mean, isn't almost always that the, you know, the, occupi the occupying regime is also um, hated, you know, yeah. um, to the hilt. In other words, how does it feel to be the bad guy is what I'm getting to, yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you see, I mean, it's, Poliona is a bit um, um, delusional. I mean, like most occupiers are, uh, occupiers are. They think they have a God-given right to be where they are and to be doing what they're doing. And Poliona is no, is, no, is no different. He doesn't, I mean, he never actually makes, I think, in the opera, I mean, I stand to be corrected, but he actually never makes a reference, you know, to how um, hated he is by the people. You know, it's always the gods that sort of play with his emotions. Mm -hmm. um, this opera has many um, wonderful uh, recitatives. I've talked about recitatives in, these, in this uh, kind of format many times. It's the... It's uh, where the singers uh, have a lot of words that usually give us a lot of information, but not much melody. And it's where the story goes forward. Usually the orchestra is um, 
uh, un uh, underpinning that with dry chords, sometimes longer chords. But the onus is on the, um, each character to really, really express and be the best singing actor they can be. Yeah. I think, um, do, do you notice, Joe, how much, you know, in the work, um, that to find the contrast between when you're doing a recitative, which is more spoken, still singing, but more spoken, and when you have the, the line of the melody, and Bellini's melodies are so long and so expansive. Um, it's not because you're here, but it's, it is really a privilege to, you know, to do this, to sing this for the first time with you. Because you're, not I'm believe, learning. you're not going to believe this, Joe. There's a question that says, um, how is it to work with me? <laughs> I, I, which I, when, when my wife saw this, uh, when she saw these cards, she said, you're not going to ask that, are you? And I wasn't going to, but... Do, do you really were, have it? <laughs> I, I do, actually. <laughs> no, I, it, it really, because, I mean, joking aside, um, Maestro Papano, and I do mean uh, what I say, and I'm, you know, and um, he has the command of the bel canto that um, sometimes, he did tell me during rehearsal, he told me, Joseph, what are you doing? I mean, you're singing about death, about destruction, about, you know, a life, you know, thrown away in the ashes, you know, in the fire, and you're singing as if you just, you know, made love uh, with, with the soprano. No, that's in the first act. <laughs> <laughs> and this is true, this, this, this conversation, conversations act actually happen because it's, it's not always to the service of the music to um, sound beautiful. By sound beautiful, I don't mean that one has to sound ugly, not at all. But it's a case for one example, um, you know, um, when Verdi writes in Macbeth about Lady Macbeth, una voce cupa, and I, I forgot the other adjective, adjective he used, maybe orrenda, but, but sort of, you know, he wanted dark. a dark, um, um, almost... Um, Who did? Who did so? or almost horrible quality to convey what, what, what was in the, in the expression you of the music. Put so, you put your finger on something very, very important. The melodies in bel canto operas often have a very uh, easy feel to them, and they can be very pleasant. You can go out whistling that. That tune is Norma saying, I. I'm savoring watching you suffer. <laughs> and you've got to be careful because when you sing those melodies and they're dum da 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 dum da 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 dum da da dum da dum da da it can be rumpty tumpty tumpty da instead of di da 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 di da 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 di and having a power. And um, this is one of the traps of the bel canto music. Yeah. Um, and and you've got to to imbue this music with with dignity, and I think that's that's our work together, isn't it? In a certain same, way. same like in spoken language. I mean, if you if you ask uh, somebody, you know, just by changing the tone and saying the same words, you can make uh, the whole difference. For example, um, how are you, Joseph? Oh, I'm I'm wonderful. I'm I'm fantastic. Thank you. Or how are you, Joseph? Oh yeah, I'm wonderful. I'm fantastic. Thanks. Of course, I, I said the exact same way. I mean, the exact same thing. But the difference in the way I say it makes the whole phrase change meaning and mm -hmm. character. And, and, and that is hard to do, especially if you're very musical. Mm -hmm. If you're very musical, you sing and, and you want to make shapes and, and, and gorgeous lines and gorgeous sounds. But you've got to go that extra step and you've always got to be thinking about the language and about, about what it is that you're saying. I mean. I've said that line a hundred times in these, in these um, um, formats here uh, in Inside Evenings. But with a bel canto opera and something so strong as this, it goes double. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph, I wish you only the greatest success. You've been a fantastic colleague. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for coming and sharing your insight with us. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. So still to come, director Alex Ole and Valentina Carrasco. And we have a digital program for Norma, available free on our website to all of you. Go to roh.org.uk slash publications and use the code in capitals, FREE NORMA. 
Now, a bit more from me. So, let's um, look into some of the music. Um, I'd like to introduce my pianist for tonight, Jonathan Santagada. I used the word vehemence before when I introduced the piece. Um, think of the situation and this occupation and this oppression. You certainly get a picture of that at the beginning of the overture. <laughs> the use of silence is fantastic. <laughs> in the Sturm und Drang school of uh, Schubert, Beethoven, um, um, yeah, tempest, a certain tempestuous atmosphere. But look what happens next, and this is the key to the opera norma, is this next phrase. That kind of tenderness is very much a visiting card, a hallmark of the writing of Bellini, that, that melody, that, those shapes. It goes on. Etc., etc., you get the idea. And it's quite a stormy affair. And we get this melody on page three. Da da dum 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 dee. Da dum dum. One, two, three. This was the melody that I told you where Norma is savoring his, his suffering, where she's got him where she wants him. Again, the tenderness takes over though. Do you hear those sighing accents? Again, the melody will never be flat in, in, in Bellini. It will always have a kind of sobbing in its musicality. And when you hear a wind player do that properly, it's, it's really, really um, incredibly expressive. Um, the piece boils and boils and boils and boils. And, there's, and, it, and you, you think you're coming to a... An incredible finale. Um, yeah, from there, one and. And then all of a sudden, now this is eighteen. This is eighteen thirty-two. That could be Schubert, couldn't it? It could also be Rossini at the end of William Tell. At the end of William Tell, Rossini created a, 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 a hymn to liberty, but it also related to, to pantheistic um, beliefs and nature being supreme. And we get this, this incredible surprise. Um, you don't have to hear the rest of it. I want you to come to the performance to hear it. Because <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's so beautiful and so unexpected. And then the overture ends with, um, with the usual bang, 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 and big finish. Um, I spoke of the piece's big bones. We get a feeling of the big bones of the piece by the many introductions to scenes which are quite long. They're very, very expansive. Now, of course, you could say, well, characters have to come on, the chorus has to come on, and Bellini wrote a lot of music so that they could come on comfortably. But it's not only that. There's just a, an immense breadth of it. And I'm sure that this is one of the things that must have attracted Richard Wagner. We bring up Richard Wagner's name all the time because he was a real character, but he loved this piece. It's very surprising. He loved this piece. And um, the first scene, to just give you an idea, is um, where we get an idea of the sect. Some ancient sounds you hear. Uh, 
kind of a brooding darkness. The accents come again. Accent. See, and this part of the piano, um, it, 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 it could almost be a slow movement of Beethoven sonata. It uh, has very, very much that color. Um, at the beginning, we hear um, the men's chorus, and um, they are preparing for the ritual, the prayer to the moon, to Irmin Sul, their god, but they're hungry and restless to go to war. And of course, Norma hears about this restlessness. And she's quite unforgiving when we first meet her. Now, before the Norma scene, there is the introduction of the tenor. But since we've had such a nice conversation uh, with Joseph, you, um, you get the idea. Um, but Norma's scene starts like this. <laughs> dissonances listen to this you, and you get the idea this immense tableau all, all the brass all the strings all the woodwinds playing this this hymn and they say norma the chorus norma viene le cinge la chioma la verbena i misteri sacrati talking about the mistletoe and the rite that's going to take place i talked about um, uh, the Romans, but I didn't, um, I, and the, the oppression, but these people are very, very strong too. Now, if you play La Marcia, dom, 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 this is the, uh, the, perhaps the, the best known melody in the piece. Notice that, it, that um, here we're talking about a religious sect, a cult, a, a group, a community of people. But there's a martial quality to it, isn't there? There's military there. And that's very, very important because the piece um, speaks as much ab about religion as it does, uh, as, uh, about, as much ab about the military and the conflict and its bellicose uh, themes as it does about religion and duty to that religion and the rules of that religion. Now, I spoke before about recitative, and Norma's um, introductory recitative is perhaps one of the most fascinating um, in all opera, because often she sings without the orchestra. And she, believe me, she gets our attention. Um, she says, I've heard seditious voices, voices speaking of war, how is this possible uh, in front of our altar and in front of our God? Um, and uh, do we presume to dictate to Norma? It doesn't depend on human uh, designs, but on divine. And her father says, yes, but, yeah. and we want to, and, they, and the chorus say, si brandisca la spada, we want to, to brandish our swords. And she says, and it will fall, your sword will fall um, if, you don't, if you don't wait for the right moment. Um, the days are not yet mature for vengeance. You'll hear the word vendetta a lot. Um, and, um, well, you, you get the idea. Um, let me give you an idea of performing this recitative that leads into the Casta Diva. Casta Diva, um, chaste goddess, she talks about the moon. Isn't it funny that she uses the word chaste, just exactly what she is not? No, but it's important. And she uses this entire scene to, to try to uh, temper in fact, she uses the word uh, 
temper your audacious zeal, she says in the second verse of, of Casta Diva. Second part of, of, the, of the aria, she goes off into a dream. You imagine her almost as the countess in the marriage of Figaro. And she says, uh, uh, where the countess says, Dove sono i bei momenti? Where are those beautiful moments? The nostalgic view of, of, uh, of the love affair with her husband, and which is no longer, um, yes, shall we say, close. And um, Norma goes off into a dream world, um, uh, a, a very nostalgic dream world. Um, beautiful how, how Bellini paints all these different colors um, through the simplest of means. But let's, let's meet Rachele Stanishi, who will sing some of the recitative for us tonight of Roma. So ci fai dam, dam, da, dam, dam, l'ultima cosa? Seditious voices. Seditious voices. di guerra, abdi che il sar si attenta, risolare del Dio. and then we get aim frantacada where they say we'll brandish the swords and one si brandisca una volta
And then we get the famous arpeggio that Margaret talked about. Now, just play the arpeggio. Don't play the melody. I want to talk about this arpeggio because it's a circle, isn't it? Keep going. And it's supposed to have a kind of hypnotic effect. Now, let's add the tune to it. Again, in terms of structure, quite a long introduction before the singer actually starts to sing. We'll just do a few phrases, just <laughs> because I don't want to give it all away, of course. that Bellinian magic there that is so characteristic. Now, um, we meet Adalgisa, um, the other character, and um, to give an idea of her timorous nature, and of course she would be very nervous. She's, she's starting a love affair with the Roman proconsul. She's, <laughs> she's this young girl. Um, to give you an idea of the music. You can just see her kind of nervously. But of course, the inevitable lyricism will to how long this melody is spun out. It's no accident that Chopin was a huge admirer of Bellini. Did you hear those? Almost kind of expressing that, that, that fear, that, that sensitivity. And it, it, I think for the performers, it takes tremendous amount of, of sensitivity. I, I do tend to think when I'm working on this stuff uh, that, I'm, that I am playing Chopin or that I'm, I'm thinking in those terms, that kind of... And the tremendous um, knowledge, somehow instinctive or I don't know where, between Bellini and Felice Romani, his librettist, the knowledge about how a woman's mind works and the psychology of the woman, it's fantastic. Just absolutely beautiful. Now there's a lovely arioso, there's a wonderful duet with the tenor, um, and, uh, and then Adalgisa goes and, uh, to Norma and tells her that she's in love, and this, the duet, and the way it's done in this production is beautiful, it's like a confession. Um, um, and the, the two girls speak, and. Adalgisa talks about her new love, and Norma uh, remembers. And it's, this is was one of the great scenes. And I, unfortunately, I don't have an Adalgisa, and I ain't going to sing it for you. So, <laughs> so, um, um, but yeah, the duets between all these characters, but especially between the ladies, are just well, they're famous. I want to. Um, 
do another recitative for you. The, the scene where she contemplates killing the children. Because that's very special uh, recitative. Rossini stole this from Bellini, this used that long arpeggio in this Stabat Mater. That they don't shouldn't see the hand that will strike them. Do you hear that little accent then? Oh. And these little sighing figures. What am I to do? I cannot live. Slaves, schiavi. Never. They must die. I can't get near to them. I'm frozen. I'm going to kill them. The greatest melody in the piece is here. My tender, tender children. My delight. What have they done? They're Polione's children.
Right there. I mean, who needs... <laughs> Yeah, who needs Castadiva after that, really? <laughs> no, seriously, that's a recitative, and that's, that's the scene. This is heartbreaking. And um, I would like to do just one uh, more bit, um, and that's also a tune that has this kind of accompaniment, and it's when Polione is brought in and she says, I've got you in my hand. I've got you here. And, and we're going to kill you. And, um, and she's, all the suffering that she has gone through, the betrayal, and um, she somehow needs to purge herself of this, and of, of this feeling and, and, to get, and to get revenge. Um, but of course, of, of course, he when he sees the strength and nobility of this woman and um, he says he still loves her. Just that's the last excerpt we're going to do um, for In Myanmar. Tori. swear to my demands and his answer is no <laughs> it's this it's fantastic uh, confrontation between the two of them and you see again how this do, do, di, do, do. and on top of this melody that sits with simple harmonies underneath but with maximum maximum effect and expression and um, and emotion yeah Rachele and Jonathan, thank you so, so much. It's good. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Brava. Thank you. <laughs> so now um, we welcome our director, Alex Ole, and associate director, Valentina Carrasco. Please. <laughs> Ciao, Alex. So, Alex, are you going to speak in English tonight, or? No. Or no? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I try, but uh, I think it can be better if Valentina translates me. I'm so sorry, but I don't speak English very good. No, it's fine. And to explain about the, the concept, I prefer if she translates me. Okay. You had such a, an amazing success with uh, Edip of Enescu last season. I don't know how many of you saw it, but it was quite an evening. I mean, from every standpoint, um, bringing a new piece to Covent Garden and um, a repertoire 
really that very few people are, were aware of. And to do it with, it with such a majestic style visually and, um, and such clear storytelling, just absolutely brilliant. I have to tell you that they uh, uh, are bringing, um, together with, um, um, with Alphonse Flores and Luc Castells, Alphonse the, the uh, stage designer and Luc Castells the costume designer, together the whole team have brought together something very, very strong for this piece. And I'm very, very happy because um, this piece is it not just put a couple of flats up and have great singers and, and have the orchestra play and the conduct, conductor conduct. It's, it's more than that. You need, it's a big piece and you need a big setting and you need a big vision and you've achieved that. But you've done it in your own special way. We talked, originally we talked about war, we talked about religion, we talked about duty. Now, the word religion seemed to have a strong it, it brought a, str a very strong reaction from you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Sí. Uh, al principio, cuando nos llamó Casper para para plantearnos para hacer una nueva producción, ¿no? En, eh, aquí en el, en el teatro, pues, pues, lógicamente era un, un orgullo venir a, a, a estrenar aquí una obra. Pero tengo que decir que cuando nos dijo, hombre, nos gustaría que hicieras una norma, pues yo dije, oh my god, una norma. That part you understood, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Initially, when we got the offer to do uh, a creation here at the Royal Opera House, it was great news, and we were super happy. Casper called us, yeah, well, we'd like you to do something new for us, and blah, blah. And then he said that it was Norma, and then he goes there, oh my god, huh? <laughs> Norma, yeah. <laughs> Honestamente, tengo que decir, que tenía, tuve un, al principio unos pequeños prejuicios, ¿no? No en cuanto a la música, que me parecía que tiene partes fantásticas, pero sí en cuanto, digamos, al, al, al libreto, ¿no? Quizá porque es una obra que pertenece a pleno romanticismo italiano, Entonces una, es una, es una, una obra como muy heroica, ¿no? un melodrama pasional. So, because it has this sort of very um, romantic, Italian romantic flavor to it, with a lot of, like a melodramatic, passional piece. Eh, y las... Y las producciones que había visto, tanto en directo como en DVD, siempre estaban hechas de una manera como bastante convencional. Eh, y es por eso que yo creo que te, tenía en un principio unos, unos ciertos prejuicios, ¿no? Of course, a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the stagings you see are done sometimes in not the luckiest way. That, that things, the things we have, have come across so far. So we had in our minds stuck to all those things when we first heard the invitation of Norma. So yeah. those prejudices. Cavernas, templos, los druidas, Caves, los temples, druids, ¿no? with horns, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Romans. ¿Eh? ¿Qué se hace con esto, no? It's a difficult chunk, no? It's all together. What do you yeah. do with this? Son, son, son como una historia con, con cosas muy, como muy extremas, no? La, la, la Norma Medea que está a punto de matar a sus hijos, el padre que perdona a su hija en el último momento, no? Uh, well, you have very extreme things, the, the, the medic Norma, who's about to kill her children, uh, the father that, although, you know, she goes, she will go to, to die, forgives her daughter for her sins, so to speak. And all this, these elements are so much linked to the melodrama in Italy, no? Y cuando nos hicimos la pregunta de dónde podría pasar esta Norma, lo primero que se nos vino a la cabeza, como comentaba Tony, la idea de una situación bélica, ¿no? de una guerra, algo, una situación extrema donde este tipo de cosas extremas pudieran pasar, ¿no? So, in a way, um, the first idea that came to us was the war, not only because it's very present actually in the piece, it's what they, they speak about almost in the beginning, uh, but also because a war brings an extreme situation to, to, to a place, and where this things so extreme can happen, no? People get burned and a mother wanting to ch kill their children. It's, it's, it's so extreme, the war, that might 
uh, trigger things like this. Eh, y cuando esto le comentamos a Tony y a Casper esta idea, dijeron, hombre, mm, no, no estaban muy convencidos. No, the, mm, it's Tony and Casper looking at the war idea. <laughs> It was not so convincing. It was not exactly probably the main point of the piece. Probably. Yo creo que, y sobre todo Tony nos hizo entender uh, de una manera muy clara que había algo más en la pieza, ¿no? Y, y ese algo más es la... la Digamos, es norma, ¿no? Es la personaje que tiene problemas y dudas con, absolutamente contemporáneos, ¿no? And then, um, especially talking to Tony about this, uh, he made us see that there were other issues that probably were more important in a way than the war context itself. And things that have to do with Norma herself, who she is as a character and, and her passions and her restrictions as a priestess. Es un personaje tremendamente humano, ¿no? And she's a very human, humanized character in the opera. It's very, you can see very closely, very human emotions through her. Volvimos a leer mejor el libreto. So we read the libreto again, <laughs> carefully. <laughs> Entonces a, a, empezó a aparecer eh, castidad, celibato. And then we heard all this chastity, it's kind of celibate, although the word is not said. She's supposed to la not to have a husband, la not confesión, to have. La procesión. There were confessions, processions, eh, sacerdotes, sacerdotisas, priests, druidas. Druids. Eh. <laughs> Empezamos a atender, a entender un poquito lo que comentaba ahora y desde el principio Tony, la importancia que tiene la religión en esta, en esta obra. ¿no? And then we realize the way that religion has in this piece. Y como Norma representa... Eh, el dilema de una mujer que cae víctima de las divergencias entre, un, entre restricciones y convenciones de, de una sociedad y su situación personal. And we saw uh, Norma like in a corner mm, uh, between these forces, between the forces of the restrictions and the and the, the rules of a society that she has to f not only she's part of but she also is leading. She has a leading part in and her um, feelings and uh, inclinations as a woman, hmm? passion, the motherhood, uh, things that as a woman she would have and were completely uh, against her duties. Mm -hmm. La contradicción que supone para Norma eh, el lugar que ocupa en la jerarquía eclesiástica ¿no? de, de, de la comunidad en, eh, en, en la que es el máximo, ¿no? y, y ella como mujer, como madre, como amante, And so this sort of, this thing again, where she occupies this huge place, this very important place within her community, and she's supposed to be on the side of the rulers of her community, and at the same time, she, being a woman, uh, uh, wants to be mother, wants to have a lover, and how that is impossible for her. Norma, supone, de alguna manera, la lucha del individuo frente al Estado, frente a un Estado totalitario o frente a los, a los, uh, ¿no? los poderes, digamos, religiosos, políticos, militares. It somehow also shows the, the fight of an individual against the powers, the, you could call them the state or the religious powers or the established powers, um, against the desire of a, the individual, which is actually, actually something very, from the romanticism, ¿no? the guy alone against the rest, that is what... Y ya Very cuando, common in cuando nos planteamos esta contemporanización, digamos, de la obra, es cuando aparece de manera muy clara el fanatismo de esta comunidad, ¿no? So when we thought about this context, we started to realize that these guys, there's something about the fanatism of these people, the sort of uh, impossibility for Norma to be kept alive after having, after published the news that she has two children. Uh, that is quite extreme. She's burned out. She's killed by burning in the libretto. That's very strong. So that is quite extreme. It takes a lot of extreme yeah. thought to get to that point. Can you give us an idea of uh, some the visual language that you're going to be using? Yeah, of course. Um, can you put the first? Sí. Esta es una imagen de, de un país del este eh, que la he querido mostrar para que se entienda también un poquito, y a partir de algunas imágenes que veremos, que hemos querido jugar con uh, una propuesta como hiperrealista, 
digamos, de diferentes eh, elementos, digamos, tanto para, desde el punto de vista del concepto de la obra como de la puesta en escena. Y de, y de este hiperrealismo hemos generado una propia ficción, hemos creado un mundo, es decir, porque la idea no es criticar la religión, eh, en este caso, cristiana o católica, que es la nuestra, ¿no? como españoles, ¿no? eh, sino, digamos, o, o, o criticar una religión que aglutina a la gente en un sentido positivo, sino la idea del fanatismo. ¿no? So, the starting point for us with the accent was into uh, criticize this fanatism, this, um, and we, because these things are alive, they're among us, uh, we thought of taking quite a realistic point of view at it, um, and we started to look for images. We thought it was probably better to speak about a religion that from origin or from provenance uh, was closer to us. So we took more or less the shape, although it's not a specific religion, any specific religion, we did give the shape of a Christian religion. Uh, and uh, so, and we started to look for um, uh, inputs about that, that would speak in a realistic manner and from there create a fiction from it that would serve the piece. So we looked at some images and this came up. This is a cemetery of crosses um, in Eastern Europe, uh, outside of a city which name I don't remember now, actually. Um, and uh, people have started abandoned crosses there that they were not used and they started to create piles of it and they were removed and people were bringing them back to put them all together. And in time it became a tradition and actually what happened is that now people on purpose add more crosses and he has created this shape, which evoked a bit for us what the sets were going to become later. Sí. Can, can uh, you then show us? Yeah, there we go. Sí. El, digamos, el, el set son 1,200 cruces. We have 1,200 crosses mm -hmm. uh, on, this, on our set. It's, it's built, it's like a big wood, so to speak, or, or, or spider web of crosses. Um, Para nosotros también, de alguna manera, nos simboliza también un bosque, ¿no? Mm -hmm. Sí, lo que voy a decir. You can change, please, the... So it's very much the look of a forest, too, which is actually yeah. original setting, but in a very, very special, very special way, ¿no? Um, so, in a way, it's a bit abstract. Sometimes it becomes, you know, because the, the multiplicity of the crosses, of course, you lose the point of view of the cross. You don't see it anymore after a while. You just see this, this forest, this... Uh, and uh, so it becomes kind of abstract. So you can actually think it's, as uh, Tony says, a wood or something like that. But at the same time, it's there. And also the presence of the martyrdom. Huh? I mean, the cross is also an instrument of torture and martyrdom which is what uh, Norma is going to suffer from at the end. Digamos, es un, un espacio diseñado por Alfonso Flores y que dentro de, digamos, de que son 1200 cruces, uh, a, a partir de las luces del, y de mo algunos movimientos de torres y tal, el espacio es capaz de irse transformando constantemente. ¿no? Can you talk about, um, uh, we've talked about, we keep to coming back to Norma herself. Do you have any um, images, costume images of... Yes, because I'd love to. See. Sí. This is the this is the druidas. This is Oroveso, and there is the officials. The druidas for us it's because hay muchas comunidades, no, eh, como los caballeros de la Cruz de Malta, pero sobre todo en España, hay comunidades religiosas de gente normalmente como muy muy reaccionaria, muy eh, no, muy conservadora, muy de derechas, uh. no, que tienen bastante un significado para nosotros muy próximo a la época franquista y de lo cual hemos digamos cogido como punto de inspiración, ¿no? So in a way we to do the druids instead of the horns we thought of um, these communities in in you have this kind of religious order it's not orders because it's not it's um, communities like uh, the Knights of the Cross of Malta of uh, of or Opus Dei, or these are like um, non-clerical orders, but with a strong religious um, belief, and and they normally gather for different things. They can do organize a religious celebration. That is one of the main uh, original uh, aims of these communities. Uh, but they, when in time they have become something else, they have been linked to power very much. In Spain, for example, during Franco times, Opus Dei, all of those were really, really linked to, to the political powers. And which is very interesting, by the way, if I say, I may say, at this connection, because the problem, of course, we're talking about fanatism and we're talking about a very vicious 
a link of religion and power. And that is a problem. The political power and the religion are linked here. And that it, there's, there is an issue also with that. And within this universe, that's the idea was to show that. Mm -hmm. Aquí podemos ver los, los, lo que nosotros en España llamamos los nazarenos, que no, no, no tiene que ver con el Cocus Clan. ¿eh? Aquí tenemos las sacerdotisas, aquí tendríamos a Dalgisa, y después en alguna escena, porque aparece en el, en el libreto, como se llama, los sacrificatori, que aunque no, tienen, no, no es exactamente esto, pero nos gustaba, digamos, este, unos personajes que tenemos como unas cruces, que todo tiene que ver, digamos, con una cosa muy, muy, muy española. Uh, we took our imaginary um, from a lot of the uh, religious celebrations you can see in Spain, even today. Uh, this guys in white and snow cuckoo's clan is called Nazarenos. Mm -hmm. uh, they're supposed to uh, precede the carrying of virgins and st statues uh, of Christ and different images uh, in the Eastern processions and other processions. Um, normally, they're not, they're not priests. They are, um, I don't know, call that civilians, likes. Huh? Um, then we have the images of priests and priestesses dressed as uh, kind of cardinals type. Uh, we have other, um, what we call the sacrificatory, because that's the way they appear in the libretto, although it's something else in the libretto. It's people carrying big crosses. Everything you see in the, play, in the, in the costumes is documented, is nowadays, um, uh, nowadays, images is all taken from strictly reality. With it, only um, freedom we took was to change the original symbol because we don't actually want to refer to any particular religion. So we took, uh, we don't use the conventional Christian or, or Catholic um, cross or anything like that. We use other symbols because for us, what is interesting is this liturgy on one side, this colorful liturgy, but also very um, drastic, very strict liturgy. Also mixed also with this idea of um, a religious community that is actually linked with the political power. Esta es la imagen. Bueno, esto es algo que nosotros de alguna manera hemos querido también incidir mucho en, en este final con la intervención en la última escena de los niños y ver esta idea de la familia para ver hasta dónde es capaz ¿no? el, fanat el fanatismo de, digamos, de esta comunidad que nosotros hemos creado. ¿no? capaces, digamos, de, de llevar a sus protagonistas, a, o sea, a Norma y a Polione, a, a la hoguera, ¿no? Y, y bueno, esta es un poco la, la idea final donde uh, aparecen, digamos, los, ¿no? la, la idea de la familia y cómo esta gente, digamos, entre ellos mismos, ¿no? Incluso el propio Oroveso como padre eh, ya no puede evitar eh, el hecho de haber exaltado a esta gente con una serie de, nunca mejor dicho, de normas, ¿no? Uh, y de, restric de restricciones que llevan a esto, ¿no? Uh, the image that you see now here is more or less put together um, something that happens towards the end, well, no, actually, the end. Uh, and you can see from one side this family aspect, you know, Norma with Polione and her children, um, with, you know, facing, you well, know, the man with the dark glasses is Oroveso, um, and these are all the druids and military that surround him. Um, and it's to show a bit this contrast on also how, for example, a character like Oroveso himself ends up being in the corner because he is forced to allow the death of his own daughter. Uh, although, of course, he would like to forgive her life, probably. But he has to. It's a duty. Mm? It's a duty. Now she has to die. And he, as the sort of the chief of this community, has to allow that. And that is terrible. Um, so this picture is a bit showing that aspect, no? the, the, the domestic life, the, 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 the sensitive, the, and the, the motherhood and all the, all the feelings of Norma and the passions against uh, the powers no? the, and, the, mm. and the duty. Mm? Funny enough, Norma in Spanish means also rule, and uh, in Italian too. In mm. definitiva, digamos que otra, lo que hemos intentado, en definitiva lo que hemos intentado, es que la gente, cuando vea nuestra norma, reflexione, ¿no? Que no simplemente vea una propuesta visual, ¿no? O que ya haya podido ver antes, sino dotarla de un cierto contenido eh, que emocionalmente a la gente, pues bueno, pues, que tocar un poco la fibra, ¿no? And the idea for us was a bit to have a bit at the end this sort of, the people are left with this kind of question mark, at least. When you leave, that you not have 
just uh, from our side seen like a beautiful set or beautiful costumes. Um, of course, you've been uh, transpersed by this amazing music and the singing, which is really, really good. Uh, I mean, it's outstanding. Uh, but that you also have a, some nachdenken, like some thoughts, uh, some, something that stays there after you, the melody maybe fades out and there's some question there. Uh, what is it? What, what happened? Why, how can you get that far you know, to burn people for ideas well, and Valentina, for rules? Valentina and Alex, I think, I think um, you've given us lots to think about. What I can say is that uh, the essence of the story is there and the, the, the visual element is incredibly, incredibly strong. And um, um, I can say I'm, I'm really very happy and I, I, love, I love to see um, Norma in a, in a woman's priest outfit. I don't know, there's something about it. To, uh, and to see her with her family there, it's just fa absolutely fantastic. I, I don't know, it, it's, I find that very, very moving. I want to thank you for being here tonight. And um, this is really very special for us. And it's my first time working with you, but it's been, so far, it's been an absolute delight and a pleasure. Um, I want to say to those people who are uh, watching us and listening to us that don't forget there's a cinema relay of this on the 26th of September. I'm also very excited, of course, about the opening night, which is on the 12th of September, if you can be here live. Um, but hopefully after tonight, um, you're going to be a normal, normal files, normal files. Um, good night and thank you very, very much. Thank you.